Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I am here with Sandra Chow, and I'm so excited for this conversation because, you know, we we get to interview so many great people in the guest seat, but it's always extra special when we bring someone on the show who has been a longtime listener of the podcast. And Sandra just told me before we hit record that she religiously listens to Cubicle to CEO, which I am beyond honored. So Sandra, thank you for being here. No, thank you so much for having me, Ellen. Of course, of course. You know, your pitch was super interesting to us because you described this visual strategy that helped you go from basically, you, like you said yourself, next to no clients for three years and transformed your business into a booked out thriving business where you're charging clients five to $10,000 for these branding projects and visual design projects, which we will get into. That is the case study for today. So I'm teasing that out now. But as you know, Sandra, we always like to start by hearing our guests' cubicle to CEO story. So what's yours? Yeah. So um, prior to doing all of this, I was actually a lawyer. Um, So I was working as an intellectual property and technology lawyer um, over in Hong Kong. Um, I practiced for about seven years. So basically what happened, it's a little bit cliche though. So (laughs) basically what happened was um, I was quite burnt out. I was working really long hours um, and it kind of coincided with the time where I was planning my wedding. I was planning three weddings, one for Sydney, one for Hong Kong, one for Taiwan. So I spent a lot of time going through things like wedding blogs, little details, all those kinds of things. And um, I I really fell in love with it. Um, And I think it kind of reignited my passion for like the arts, which was something, and I don't know if this resonates with you, Ellen, but it was something that um, my parents didn't really allow me to do in school. It was one of those things, you know, I was kind of geared towards specific professions when I was growing up. And so it just kind of triggered something. And I actually, in the end, um, on the side, started a wedding blog in Hong Kong, which sort of focused on sharing ideas because I noticed the wedding industry was a little bit different in Hong Kong um, versus in Australia and, and like in the US. And um, it actually led me to meeting a lot of different vendors and and sort of built this little community. And I probably wouldn't recommend this to everybody, but I basically had a really bad day at work. <laughs> and it was something that I've kind of, and, and it sort of started taking a toll on my health. And it, I kind of really wanted to leave already, but I just didn't really have the guts to do it. And it really took like a really horrible day for me to be like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. So I didn't really have much of a plan, which is why, you know, I wouldn't really recommend uh, just the sort of doing that very spontaneously, but um, I quit. And then I sort of continued with the wedding blog, but it gave me that kind of opportunity to meet a lot of these creatives and vendors that I had sort of um, got connected with in Hong Kong through the blog. And I met up for coffee with a lovely floral and events designer um, who was originally from Germany. And we started chatting and she was hap- She was actually looking for a stylist and she saw something in me and asked me if I wanted to go and learn with her. So I actually um, took a job with her um, as a freelance stylist and that kind of got me into sort of the event styling side. And over time, eventually I moved back to Sydney um, and started my business um, here as an event stylist. So it's sort of a bit of a roundabout way, but that's kind of how how I got to where I am now. Well, I, I can definitely relate to your story, Sandra, because as you know, I also quit my job without much of a backup plan. However, I will say yours is even more spur of the moment than mine because <laughs> you you literally had a spontaneous combustion and was like, done, we're out over this, you know? Whereas for me, I did, you know, I did have a 30 to 60 day window where I had given notice and it was a planned exit. But after the exit, there was not much on my calendar. (laughs) (laughs) So I, I can, I can relate to kind of leaping into the unknown. And I think it's amazing that you were able to foster your love for creativity later on in your life. You mentioned that your parents weren't very supportive, perhaps, of you exploring that in in your school days. And, you know, I I hear that a lot among are you is your family a first generation immigrant family? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's I, I kind of assume because I, I feel like that's very common, especially among like Asian yeah. households. And so um for me, I, I was very lucky that my parents did pour a lot of time and resources into 
you know, helping us grow up with the arts, music, dance, uh, actual like drawing, art, all those things. But certainly as a career track, it was not really something we discussed. And so <laughs> yeah. I, I love hearing your story. And that kind of, you know, is is really interesting to me that you started as an event stylist. So take us back to the beginning of, of today's case study. You know, you you're at this point, we're setting the stage. You are not really getting any clients. And this kind of was the status quo for you for about three years. Was this in your event styling business or was this a different business that you then started later on? So it was in the event styling business. So um, I did a bit of sort of smaller events in Hong Kong because I was still sort of freelancing um, with the sort of floral and events design company. But on the side, I was taking like smaller jobs, Mm -hmm. but they weren't really you know, they probably weren't really the right (laughs) kind of events, you know, um, and I wasn't really, I was charging like next to nothing, basically. And but I was really trying to sort of build up that portfolio, which I thought would sort of help, you know, um, help me build the business a bit more and get more clients, but it kind of didn't really work that way. Um, And then I found that the case as well, too, when I sort of moved back to Sydney, and I was sort of essentially starting from scratch again, but I did have a lot of connections here already, and had that kind of, um, sort of community here, but I still wasn't really seeing kind of the right leads, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, yeah, I was getting the leads, but they were either not really the right clients or the right style, or perhaps um, they were kind of just sort of price haggling. So it was it was a little bit sort of tricky in that sense. So I would be taking on some work for the sake of taking it on, but um, and even shoots as well, too, on the side that were more sort of um, wedding related or events related. And it just really wasn't really going anywhere. And and I have to say, it was probably three years until I actually started seeing some like proper income coming in. I know what many of our listeners probably welcome that honesty, you know, <laughs> because it's so easy for a lot of people to have this, what appears to be a moonshot to success. And yeah. I think it's really refreshing for you to sit here in front of me today and say, you know, for three years, this was a struggle. It was hard to make it a viable business, a viable income. And I know you're not alone in that. There are many thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of entrepreneurs who go through that same process. It's just not often that those stories are highlighted. And so I think it's really important, that transparency that you've brought here. And then you implemented this visual strategy, this mysterious visual strategy, which I'm so excited to dive into because when I saw your pitch, I was like, what is this? We have to have this person on the show to talk about to talk about her strategy. So Sandra, tell us what is this visual strategy because it's what changed everything in your business in terms of attracting the right clients and at higher price points. So give us a quick top-down breakdown of what that looks like. Yeah. So I mean, we hear about brand strategy a lot, right? Which is sort of about building the foundation for your brand identity. And visual strategy, basically, it helps you deliver your message that and resonates with your sort of your target audience. And, you know, when we're talking about visuals and visual branding, you know, a lot of the times people sort of Im- immediately think about, um, you know, imagery or whatnot. But when we're talking about visuals, you're talking about that entire visual representation of your brand. So it ranges from like your, your brand identity, like your logo, your fonts, your colors, down to your images, your videos, you know, your website design, your brand collateral, the design of your graphics, all of those things. And it's really about, um, you know, bringing all those elements together to work really cohesively for your brand to communicate for your brand. So it's all about sort of communication and making people feel and connect with your brand. And it's really through that kind of visual storytelling element, whether it's through your you know, brand elements or whether it's through like your imagery and your video. So for me, um, what I found in those sort of early days, like it wasn't really so much that, you know, my my work wasn't good or the, you know, the events that we did weren't beautiful or anything like that. And, you know, my shoots and things like that would actually get featured in blogs. But what I found was, they were just kind of pretty, Hmm. you know, um, you, I was kind of following trends, you know, things that were kind of on trend at the point, but I wasn't really creating sort of with any, um, foundation in mind or anything that was really sort of true to my aesthetic or my story and really thinking about the kinds of people that I wanted to attract. So what I actually did was sort of an overhaul of my brand and really went back to the foundations of it, really thought about the kinds of clients that I wanted to attract, you know, the price point that I wanted to, um, charge and create around that for them. And so it essentially was a really, um, 
intense form of portfolio building. So I started to be very intentional with the kind of images that I would put out, say on Instagram or my um, website, you know, the, the, the banner image that I would choose for it um, that pairs with your tagline, all those kinds of things. And instead of just focusing on the pretty, I would sort of think about things like, okay, if I wanted to attract, um, let's say a fine art wedding client um, who had that big budget, who appreciates styling and is going to spend on florals and things like that, then I also have to put that work out there, right? Because essentially what you put out there is what you get back. So um, a lot of the times visual strategy also makes you very intentional with holding back um, what you put out there. Like sometimes a lot of times we create a lot of things, you know, especially now in this very content driven world, everything that we create, we just kind of like dump and put out there and put out there. But sometimes we don't really think like, okay, if we put this out there, what kind of message are we sending? Like, do we really want to get that back? Um, so it's, it's a whole lot of, it's a very, um, what's the word, holistic strategy, looking at a lot of different things which really ties in those visual elements that come from, you know, all the different aspects of your brand, all the different client touch points. And it's not really just about like focusing on your Instagram, making that visually look appealing. It's then like, how do we translate that over to your website? Then after, you know, someone books a call with you, what happens next? What about your client proposals? Um, how does that look? What are you going to put in there visually? Or, you know, how are you going to pair your visuals with your copy, things like that, and really sort of make sure it follows through all those customer touch points to actually convert. And what I found was when I started doing that, um, the leads that I were getting in, people didn't really question my prices anymore. They would, if, if it was, you know, out of their budget, they just, they just respect it. Say like, I understand because this is what you deliver. This is the value that you offer. This is your style and aesthetic. We understand the budgets. There isn't any more of like, oh, can you, you know, can you, do you think you could do this a little bit cheaper? Or like, why is it so expensive? I sort of cut out all those kind of questions and converted a lot higher. And then later on, when I actually wanted to move out of the wedding industry, I applied the same kind of strategy, the same kind of portfolio building. And now I, you know, I don't really even get sort of wedding clients coming in anymore or anything like that. It's pure like branding work, e-com work with um, a lot of e-com brands and whatnot. And so it's essentially being that very, very sort of being very, very intentional with what you put out there visually and how that kind of works as a whole with your brand. I really like this intentional approach that you're sharing, how, how holistic it is, the way that you mapped out all the different places that your client might be visually interacting with your brand, even down to, you said like the proposal, or, I mean, I, I have to say when I'm thinking about all the different places that I'm seeing something from a vendor, let's say that I'm working with, I mean, even down to an invoice, right? There could potentially be a visual element to that. And so those are the things that I think a lot of business owners don't think that many layers deep in the client's journey. So I really like how you map that out for us. I really like the filter that you put on your own work and, and being really strategic about what parts of your portfolio you show to the world and attracted more of versus the parts that you didn't want to attract more of. However, I, I do have to say, because I'm sure I'm not the only one hearing this and maybe having this question, it is is hard, I think, already for a lot of people to show up online in any capacity, right? Because we already, many of us already may second guess our work, may may feel that we struggle with perfection, uh, perfectionism and wanting everything to be exactly right the first time that we put it out. And so there's that internal dilemma between how do we make sure that we're intentional with the work that we put out there or the visuals that we display to the world, while also ensuring that we're not holding ourselves back from creating and publishing at all. So that's something I would love to hear your your take on. And as an add-on to that, it's interesting because right now, especially with the rise of short-form video and, and TikTok and Instagram Reels in specific, people, when you look at, let's say, 2016 Instagram versus 2022 Instagram, there is certainly a drastic difference in the perfectly curated, aesthetically congruent feeds of 2016 that ruled the space versus when you hop in over to many influential uh, creators' profiles these days, it's, it, I mean, it's a hodgepodge in terms of visuals, right? It just kind of looks all over yeah. the place because they're really focused on creating that in the moment uh, sort of content. And so, 
how also do you wrestle with that dynamic? So both of those things, like both from, you know, holding yourself back from publishing at all, and then also how do you balance that with the, um, you know, the desire for organic, less filtered in the moment content? Yeah. And I think um, one of the things is, and, and this is what I failed to do at the beginning, it comes back to sort of your building those really strong foundations and knowing your brand. You know, so, I mean, if we just look at even two brands who do the same thing, they're never going to be exactly alike. You know, um, if you think about the adjectives that might describe their brand, some might be like happy, joyful, you know, vibrant. The other one um, might be, you know, more calming, peaceful, minimal, or something like that, but they could be essentially doing the same thing. And sometimes, um, and this is what I tell a lot of my clients and my students as well, too, is whenever you're thinking about putting something out there, and it doesn't have to necessarily be um, absolutely perfect. I truly believe in there's a lot of beauty in the imperfection. And if you have a look at my styling, it's never really perfect. I'm not, I'm a very sort of less is more kind of, um, I want it to be more relatable and very organic and natural is kind of how I approach um, my styling work. And so I always ask them to, you know, think about, you know, when you're about to put something out there, think about, does this actually feel like on brand to you? Even if you um, take a quick photo on your iPhone of, let's say, your messy desk space or something like that, you know, to me, that could work very well on Instagram stories. And chances are everything that you have on your desk or your materials, maybe you've got something printed that's like your proposal or something like that. All of that is already on brand. So even though it's not curated in in a sense, like it's kind of that messy behind the scenes, it would still work for your brand. And if we're talking about things like Instagram Reels or TikTok, like to me, you know, obviously that's the big thing at the moment. And again, with the whole, you know, trying not to sort of follow trends, there are so many different ways to create an Instagram reel that could work for your brand. There's no one way. And so I always encourage um, people. And when I create these for my clients as well, too, to really think about like what would feel right for the brand, like would singing and dancing and pointing feel right for your brand. And I know like for me, if you actually have a look at some of my reels, you'll actually never see my face on my reels. I'm not singing. I'm not dancing. I'm, I try to find a way to create them so that it still makes sense for my brand so that it still feels on brand. Because I know if I started doing that, people who know my brand will be like, what is she doing? <laughs> or it'll really stick out like a sore thumb because it just doesn't feel on brand for me. And so I think whether it's, um, you know, your sort of curated um picture perfect, you know, professional shoots versus your DIY behind the scenes, your own um, videos and and images, you can still ask yourself, like, does this kind of feel like you? Would this stick out, you know, on your your Instagram grid? Like, you know, would would your clients and I mean, would this resonate with your clients and your um, and your customers? Like, you've got to think about that as well, too. So for a lot of like e-com businesses, you might see a lot of them still focusing on video content content that centers around like their products and their branding and all of that but you won't necessarily see them suddenly come out singing and dancing about their product or anything like that so it's it's similar in that sense and I think it's really easy to hop on that um kind of trend that bandwagon of creating what other people are creating at the moment or just focusing on that as well too and not thinking about the follow-on effect like if you create a viral reel what happens afterwards when you bring those followers in you know i mean it's all it's great like if you you know if you're if you're comfortable and confident and create those kinds of reels that bring in the bring in those kind of followers but what happens afterwards if they go to your website are they going to be like oh this feels like a completely different brand or oh this isn't the this doesn't feel like the product that i saw at all am i really going to whip out my wallet and pay a few hundred dollars for this product like oh or or this coach doesn't oh i don't i kind of it doesn't translate over to the website or it doesn't translate over to um the pitch that they sent me after i had a call with them or i hop on a call with them and they're like they seem like a completely different person you know things like that like you have to think about all those kind of touch points like I was saying before and I think um, in terms of like what you were saying before whether you do you know sort of curate that sort of curated picture perfect feel versus nowadays um, that sort of sort of raw organic feel it still comes down to your brand like if you're an influencer or a very personal kind of brand it might make sense for you to show up constantly but if your um brand like for me if i take my instagram for example 
even though we've kind of moved away from that curated picture perfect sort of type of style, I still treat my Instagram grid as like my portfolio. It's still my visual portfolio. I only ever post like professional images from my client projects on there. But then when it comes to my Instagram stories, I I let go a lot more and be a lot more sort of, you know, natural, organic, kind of those raw kind of elements of like the behind the scenes videos and things like that. And that kind of works really well for my brand. But then it's because I still want to attract those um, high end clients for my agency, you know, but if I started just showing up and being acting very influencer like it wouldn't really work for my brand. So ultimately, I I really think it comes down to being very sure of your brand, knowing your brand really well and knowing like who you're trying to attract and what's going to attract them and resonate with them and thinking about your price points, thinking about the value that you're offering and thinking about your offerings essentially and and what would speak to that, I think. Yeah. And I what I'm hearing throughout, you know, what you're sharing is that congruency is really at the forefront, right? It's almost like treating your brand as if it were a person and it had a personality. Is that yeah, personality absolutely. the same, dependable, consistent day in, day out? Or is it like one day, you know, you're this extroverted superstar <laughs> and the next day you're very stoic and, and you know, kind of keeping people at a distance and, and talking in a way that doesn't feel familiar? I think that familiarity and that dependability is really an interesting way to look at not so much like production value, right? Like, is it curated and picture perfect or is it, you know, raw and organic filmed on my phone, but rather is the actual message that is being communicated congruent in the way that it's being shown? And I will also say it's interesting because since your brand and and your service and your offer is so visually driven, you're a visual creative, I like how you made that distinction that for you, your Instagram grid serves as a portfolio. So because that intention has always been there, it changes what you self-filter or self-select as worthy of posting or not because of how it communicates a certain message to your potential client. Whereas, and I love that you kind of like juxtaposition your case versus an influencer's case because for an influencer, if their feed is not their portfolio, not their client portfolio, then yes, of course, the way that they show up in that feed and what they allow on their grid will look different because it serves a different intention, right? So that's actually a huge aha moment for me and I'm sure for a lot of the listeners is really thinking about every place that you show up online, whether it's Instagram or TikTok, or your email, or your website, or your, I don't know, client proposal, what is the actual purpose that that piece of content is serving? And is it congruent with what you're actually allowing to show up there? So that was that was kind of my my own processing in real time of what you just shared. Was yeah. that pretty, pretty on spot with no, what you were trying to say? Yeah, it's very true, because it's that kind of consistency, that cohesion, um, that builds no like trust in your brand and no like trust in is, is essentially the thing that converts whether it's into sales or booking and I think like if if I look at myself you know in those first three years of business if that was now I can guarantee you I'd probably be jumping on the reels trend and just doing what everyone else is doing without really thinking about that purpose thinking about who I'm trying to communicate to because it's really easy to do that especially when you know there's that big emphasis now it's really easy to just do what you think is is trending and therefore working but that's not necessarily the case right Mm so it really comes down to what is sort of works for your brand and it's different for every brand even if you're doing the same thing you know there's no one brand that's exactly the same and um and i think it's really important to build that no like trust um to and, and that's kind of the way that i've done it myself personally okay we are back for a lightning round with sandra i'm gonna fire three questions your way you ready yeah okay all right so question number one I felt like this was an appropriate question to ask you because you're so visually driven. So what is a company that you have a brand crush on? Maybe one that you haven't worked for before, but like just, oh my gosh, you, you know, totally fangirl over their branding. Oh my God, Aesop is the brand. (laughs) It's like my dream brand because everything for them, like if you look at, you know, their website to the down to their product packaging, everything and the experience when you walk into like an Aesop shop, it is just consistency and cohesion all the way through. And I love it. I, yeah, it's so simple, but I love it. 
Okay, great rec. Now I have to go look them up too. <laughs> see, <laughs> see how we can learn from them. And then another a visually based uh, question, number two, what is your least favorite color? I was just curious. Um, I'm going to say pink. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, pink. I don't know. I used to really love pink, but then once I had a daughter, mm-hmm. Annabelle, I just I don't know, I went off it. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am zero percent offended because I actually learned this from my uh my friend Michelle Lewis, who is a color psychology expert. Your branding colors are not supposed to be your own personal favorite colors. It's supposed to be about the message that the color communicates subconsciously to your ideal client or ideal customer. So zero percent offended. Although actually pink is my favorite color, but <laughs> I appreciate the honest answer and respect you all the more for it. <laughs> all right. Question number three, uh, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Oh, gosh, Um, my 18 year old self, that seems so long ago. (laughs) Um, I would just say, don't be afraid to try things. I think because I kind of grew up in a way that, um, I don't know, I was kind of always told like what it was going to be like or what to do and didn't really have that kind of freedom, I felt like, like not not to say I didn't, but um, I just felt kind of um, stuck. I think. And so it took me a long time to really just let go and be like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And that was like, I don't know, another 10 years later, 10 10 plus years later. So I think, you know, I would have told myself that, like, just don't be afraid to just go for it, I think. That's great advice. And I'm sure your daughter will, you know, benefit from getting to hear her mother's (laughs) wisdom or hindsight. (laughs) Absolutely. And circling back to the case study that we have on hand here, just to provide a little bit more context for our listener. So, you know, I, I think at the beginning I may have said brand designer. I I realize now as we're talking that for some listeners, they their minds may immediately jump to, oh, she's a like a graphic designer or like a logo designer, which is not at all what you do. So just to give our listeners a little bit more context, um, your role as creative director, which I feel like is probably the better way to describe what you do, creative director and stylist, what is what does that look like in case someone's not, you know, familiar with that type of service? What do you do for your clients? So I put together the photo shoots, but I do everything but the actual photography and the videography, for example. So I will um, do work on the strategy behind um, their photo shoot. So, you know, we think about, you know, what are we trying to do with this particular campaign? Or are you, you know, launching um, this campaign to a certain market or and whatnot and create a shoot around that? Then I will actually bring together the creative team. I will do everything from prop sourcing to venue sourcing to model sourcing to the casting um, to bring on whoever I need for the team. So maybe hair and makeup artist and videographer, photographer, assistants, all of those things, and then pull to pull the shoot together and execute it on the day and do the styling as well too. And then. Um, I work with my creative team to actually create the images and the videos. And then afterwards, I work on the post-production um, in the sense of like we do the selection of the images and, you know, thinking about what worked, what doesn't work. And then a lot of my clients, I have ongoing retainers with them. So it might be um, helping them then um, to strategize for their Instagram and doing the content management for them there or um, perhaps then their website management as well, too, thinking about the visuals that we just created, the videos that we just created, um, how can we use that for their particular campaigns that they were launching or anything like that. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what I do. Everything but the video and the photos, (laughs) essentially. That is super helpful. And, you know, I I have a friend uh, who does product styling specifically for drinks. So she'll like create drink recipes and and style drinks and these, oh my God, it's so, it's such an art. It really is an art. And I, I just love seeing the work that you do. Just for our listeners who may be curious and want to go down a rabbit hole and kind of stalk your work, of course, they can go to Instagram and look at it, which will include all of Sandra's links below. But what is there like an e-com brand or another brand? Because uh, I know you do work for luxury brands as well. Is there a brand that you have done a creative shoot for before that you want to just throw out there as like a as little you know pinnacle of your work that we can go look at? Um, one of my favorite clients that I've been working with in the last couple of years is probably Naked Lab. Um, they're 
a company based out in Hong Kong. Um, they sell luxury bamboo bedding, and Ooh. it's been really fun um, helping them sort of, you know, launch a lot of their collections or new colors and um, bringing that visual storytelling element to their brand, which I think is is really important, especially for products sometimes. Like product photos are great, but then when you can attach kind of like a lifestyle to it and allow, you know, your customers and um, to sort of imagine what it would be like, you know, to sleep in those sheets, all those kinds of things. I love that aspect of, that, um, of storytelling. So that's been one that's been really fun. And then also Soul Loungewear is one. Um, it's also a brand based out in Hong Kong. Um, they sell luxury loungewear and their pieces are incredible if anybody wants to go check it out. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I'm like running over. And after our, our interview, I definitely want to go take a look. I feel so inspired, honestly, when I look at the way that others visually storytell. You know, it, it's it really does, I think, people underestimate just how much, you know, that, well, I mean, it is that saying a picture says a thousand words. It, it's true. Like yeah. it eviscerates like certain feelings in and emotions that when someone looks at a photo, it just evokes that in you. And I... I'm kind of curious when you started utilizing your own visual strategy to track the right clients to you. Um, in your case study, when you first implemented this, you were raising your prices from five hundred to two thousand dollars. Now, at the beginning of this interview, I alluded to the fact that now, of course, your pricing has more than five x from from that point in time. But at the time that you first raised your prices, five hundred to two thousand is quite a significant leap. Did that? pricing change go hand in hand with the shift in your visual strategy or did you shift your visual strategy first and then test the pricing what was the order of operations there so i probably shifted my visual strategy first and then tested the pricing out um and what i kind of did was um as i booked a client i would slowly bump it up a little bit and then feel a bit more confident with adding a little bit on and i mean to be fair like i knew 500 dollars initially like I mean, I think one, sh I, I remember doing like a full day shoot for like $200 and it didn't oh even cover gosh. like my hair cost, you know, but then it was at that time where I'm like, okay, I just need to build my portfolio. I, you know, it's like the only lead that came in that was, you know, worth doing and, and things like that. And so, um, it, it wasn't easy to raise the prices, I think coming from that, but then, so eventually I just kind of bumped it up a little bit and a little bit. And then, um, over time, when I started seeing that kind of consistency come in, I really started to look at, you know, the value that I was providing for these brands and then, um, started sort of pricing around that a little bit more. And then now, um, also because I, you know, I pivoted as well to working into a lot of more sort of e-com sort of luxury brands, um, and then doing a lot more than just a photo shoot. Like we do a lot of strategy and then, and, and those kinds of work, then, um, it adds a lot of more value to the project. So I can charge a little bit more as well too. So, um, it always kind of depends on the project with the pricing. Yeah. I think that's really encouraging to everyone listening to this, that you don't have to necessarily make that immediate jump and and feel like you're kind of just hanging out there hoping hoping that someone sees the value. I love how you explained how every client you kind of almost like a stair step, right? It's like, okay, I'll charge yeah. you 600 and then you'll you'll be charged 700 and then maybe 850 and it's kind of like an incremental each one builds upon the next. Um and also of course, if you I I think actually this is really important to state that a lot of people at the beginning of their businesses, one of the number one questions that we get from listeners of the podcast is, okay, I've, I've always been told I need to focus my 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 ideal client and, and I need to niche down, but I don't know who my ideal client is because I haven't worked with enough people to really understand who that is. And I think your story, Sandra, is proof that even though you started in event styling and you were doing weddings and maybe you were working with people who weren't your ideal people, as you continued to build your portfolio, you came to understood, okay, I love working with luxury brands. I love working with e-commerce brands. And that was a discovery that only happened because you put yourself out there and signed those clients that may not have been your ideal clients, but you, I think too many people, like they get stuck in the planning and they can hypothesize and build client avatars all day in their heads, but like, <laughs> but you truly don't know until you're actually in the field doing the work, what you like and don't like, right? Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's important to experiment. I think building a business, building a brand, it's, it's just one big experiment, right? You know, you might work with a client that you thought, you know, 
it might be something that you really wanted to do and then it turned out to be like a nightmare and not really what you want to do and and that's okay I think you know it happens and I think it's you know, a rite of passage almost to sort of go through those kind of steps. And even now, like, even though I've been doing this for a while, I still have this little wish list of the kinds of clients that I want to work with. And during my downtime, I always try to create for those potential clients so that I can, you know, maybe eventually bring them in as well too. So it's, it's still like a constant bit of an experiment for me. And I'm still sort of applying the same strategy, trying to, you know, um, expand my client base. Um, you know, cause there's always, there's always different brands that you might want to work with. Right. So it's, it's kind of fun in that sense. It's never, um, like this isn't the end all I like to think. So, and it's, it's something that I'm still continually building. And so I think, um, you just kind of have to experiment. <laughs> Yes, I could not agree more. I think entrepreneurship is the ultimate test of iteration. There is no end game. And in a way, it's like, oft, I often do describe building a business kind of like playing a video game because every time you defeat the boss in that level, you advance to the next level and there's a new boss to beat. And there's really no end to it, right? I mean, I guess the end is like when you decide maybe you want to bow out and you're done building this business. But for most of us who are in it for life, like there, there really is no end game. And so it's kind of, you really do have to enjoy the process. Otherwise it's really not worth it. And I, I love that even for you, you you're constantly even performing at the level that you are now where you're, you know, a sought after designer, a stylist, creative director, that you are still stretching your creative muscle and still designing for the clients that you don't yet have. I think that's such a cool thing. I don't think I've heard someone say that before. It's like, okay, let me just create this like pretend project for this client that doesn't really exist, but I want to yeah. bring that client in. That is so cool, which – yeah. I think is a perfect lead into like the more tactical pieces of this case study, which I know is like for you as a listener, this is probably your favorite part of the episode where people like give like, okay, these are the things you can implement right away. So let's do that for our listeners today. Uh, first question that I kind of want to know is when you started implementing your visual strategy, was it a global change as in like you applied it across all of your different channels and customer touch points at one time, or was it a gradual implementation? And if it was the latter, what did you start with? So it's probably more the latter. And for me, it probably was Instagram. Okay. Um, but I did make a conscious effort of, you know, as I kind of, you know, booked more clients and built more, I would update my website and, and think about that. But it always kind of came because my leads, I mean, all my leads even now are generally from Instagram. So um, I sort of implemented that first and it was a gradual change. So I didn't go through and delete all my old posts or anything like that. It was more of a just, I said, okay, I'm going to be very intentional. These are the kinds of things that I'm going to be doing. This is the kind of client that I want to attract. And every time I shared something, I would think about like, would, you know, does this kind of make sense? Um, would this sort of speak to them? And, and really thinking about how my visuals might pair with my actual copy messaging and things like that as well, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then over time, I would sort of lead that into my website and then update my portfolio on my website. And then also when the leads I saw started coming in, I started playing around with things like my proposals. And now I've got a pretty sort of down pat, but it would be thinking about like what kind of visuals would pair well with. And now I actually, even though this is probably not the most efficient way to do things, my proposals change for every client because I pair different visuals to speak to that particular client that I just got off a call with. Um, so that I make it sh make sure it's really targeted at them. Um, and then things and then it kind of slowly, you know, as I sort of built out more of my Instagram and started to show up more or eventually having my course, you know, thinking about the graphics that I might share on Instagram or all that. So it, it was very gradual. It's not sort of an overnight thing. It does take a bit of time. And so but I do think it's important to find a place to start. So I would always recommend like, where do you see your clients coming in the most? You know, is it is it Instagram, then I would focus on Instagram, but not just focus on it. Also, you know, think about like how that sort of translates through to all the other touch points as you do, but focus on that platform. Think about really sort of revamping that a little bit and then slowly do the other pieces as well too, because building a brand is an overnight thing. It's, you know, one of those things that is gradual and you're constantly tweaking. Like, I don't know anybody who never tweaks their website, you know, it's kind of a constant, like never done sort of thing. So um, that's kind of how I approached it myself personally. I, I really like that advice to first analyze where the most leads 
or your inbound sort of inquiries for clients and customers come from, focus on that channel first and then build out from there. I am not as visually talented as you, Sandra. I will just say that. So I, for my brain, it would be very helpful if you could give give us a tactical example of a visual switch you made. Uh, I guess like maybe maybe we could do this. Maybe okay. So you mentioned, for example, Instagram, your website, and then your client proposal. Those three places. All right. Yeah. So let's go through each of those just very quick. I mean, this could be like a 30, 60 second snapshot for each, but let's start with Instagram and say, okay, before what did the no visual strategy look like? Like what is something you might've posted before that you didn't really give much thought to? And then after you implemented the visual strategy, what did you choose to post and why? And then we'll kind of just move through those three buckets so people can kind of see yeah. this in, in, you know, in real time. Okay. So, um, pre-visual strategy, I kind of just posted things that I thought were kind of cool <laughs> and kind of cute. <laughs> there was no particular like style or anything like that, but it seemed like the thing to do at the time. So it would be very random. Um, and it's still there on Instagram if anybody wants to go back and and, and you'll very noticeably see the, the switch. It was like a very sudden, complete, like, you know, 180 switch. Um, and then what I actually did was um, think about, okay, what is the kind of, so back then it was sort of weddings. So I'm thinking about what kind of weddings did I sort of want to do, like want to, want to style. So back then it was more sort of that kind of fine art, that very elegant, um, you know, muted, um, that look. And so I set out to create shoots that sort of rep, that sort of looked like